Welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining another Data Art virtual event. Uh, this time we have a webinar on Amazon Managed Blockchain. And um, I'm excited because we have two wonderful, uh, interesting, and very informed speakers with us today. Lana Kalashnik with AWS. And by the way, thank you uh, to our colleagues at AWS for helping us put this event together. Uh, this would not have been possible without your help and support. Hey, Lana. Uh, Lana is uh, uh, a principal blockchain architect and the global blockchain partnership lead at AWS. And in fact, she's the leading mind behind the creation of the blockchain partner program at Amazon Web Services. Uh, and she will talk to us about uh, the universe of available ledger technologies at AWS this morning and um, sort of how to think about choosing the right technology for the right job, um, share some of the interesting use cases and customer success stories uh, with the uh, ledger technology on AWS. We also have Nikita Sasnov. Nikita is a, a senior technical architect at uh, DataArt. He's been with the firm for about five years and has done a number of uh, production blockchain and DLT projects in his time uh, with DataArt, including on, a, on AMB. And he will talk to us about the specifics of what AMB brings to the table, um, how to think about uh, the technology from the operational perspective, from the development perspective, what to expect. Uh, and uh, at the end of his remarks, we'll also have a hands-on walkthrough and a demonstration on how to uh, configure, run, uh, and run a smart contracts on top of an AMB network. All right, so um, please don't forget to use the question and answer functionality on Zoom. Just type in your question, and we'll, I guess we can kind of uh, feel those and answer those uh, as we go. Please you know, feel free to ask your question at any point in time. With that said, I want to get out of the way and turn the virtual floor over to Lana. Lana, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Yeah, thank you for having us. Um, very excited about being on this webcast. Um, and I'll just jump in into presentation. Um, again, please feel free to submit any questions. We'll try to answer them either right now or after the session. So uh, just let's make it interactive and make sure that we answer any questions that might come our way. So just to get started, um, um, I'm a principal blockchain architect. So as far as my background, I've been building systems since probably I was 16 years old, right? And whenever I saw this amazing technology pop up called blockchain at first, I didn't really understand how that would affect me as an engineer in my daily job or an architect, which I became much later on. But something really resonated as far this, as this concept of cryptographic verification and making sure that you're where data is immutable and available to all of the customers um, on distributed networks. All right. So um, the way we build solutions at Amazon is 90 to 95% of all of the roadmaps and features come directly from our customers. And blockchain is not an exception to this rule. So we really took our time uh, learning from our customers and understanding how they're using these technologies. Uh, we spoke to countless uh, companies in multiple um, industries. And something that we found is that this cryptographic verifiability really resonates with customers. And this is something that we're using in other AWS services. So um, essentially you're using math to trust your data instead of manually recounting or auditing solutions. This is, this is a wide reaching uh, a pattern that we're seeing pop up. But then what else makes it different? So some use cases we found is that customers really are looking to build these decentralized systems. So here we're finding customers, let's say in financial services, that are looking to build some of the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, payment systems. Uh, they're working on uh, more complex lending processes such as syndicated loans and such, or something more complex some, such as reinsurance, which we'll, we, we will hear about later on today, um, because the folks at Data Art have done a great job building that for one of our customers. Um, and on the other side of the equation, we found customers that are really looking at this cryptographic verification, but at the same time, they want those features that are blockchain-like, but they don't want to decentralize data. So they have a central authority or a central customer that wants to own all of this information and maintain it, mostly because folks either just don't need that decentralization functionality, um, or it might be not the right time in the development cycle for them. 
So because of that, we've launched two solutions. Uh, the first one is called Amazon Managed Blockchain, which supports two frameworks. Um, so it supports Hyperledger Fabric, which we will hear later on about. And it's also supporting Ethereum, which is very soon to come. So we're really excited to keep building out these solutions and really listening to our customers in the way they're using these services. And the second service, which we probably won't get to today, is Amazon Quantum Ledger, Ledger Database that really speaks to the centralized ledger that doesn't need the frills of smart contracts. So you don't need to automate the business logic as far as the operations they perform um, on the ledger itself. You're more comfortable putting this in the outside application. So for those use cases, we build this ledger append only uh, journal first database, which is very interesting as well. But we'll hopefully get to it on a different uh, webinar. So let's look, for example, at supply chains. Um, I found this book um, on my sister's um, bookshelf, and it, it's actually a Harvard Business Review on supply chain management from 10 years ago. And I really wanted to understand um, what are some of the customers' uh, problems that are plaguing supply chains. So, and one of the things that really struck me is that companies are facing incentive. Uh, issues. And they're facing those issues be because of hidden actions by partner firms. So not everything, not all actions are readily visible as far as how, body, how somebody's manipulating data, orders, you know, all of the motion as far as of the mo more complex international networks. There's some hidden information that can happen. So the data is siloed and the knowledge that of some events only some of the network participants may possess and also badly designed incentives. So this is the uh, direct cause of not having this transparency to where you don't know if you as a company would want to join this network because the incentives don't really appeal to you as a business. And it's really, really hard to tell if the incentives are misaligned for a common network. It's outside of a single company. So some of the solutions that were offered in this book um, uh, include actually acknowledging that those problems exist. So some things are not perfect and getting there is half of the battle, realizing that some of the systems don't talk to each other and it's hurting your common customers. It's is, is a half of the battle itself. Then diagnosing the cause of, of these um, hidden actions or information. Uh, usually this is just siloed systems that don't have common interfaces, uh, geographical distances, so on and so forth and then redesigning or creating new incentives that really cause the partners in the network to behave in the way that makes the whole network grow. So, and so let's look a little bit deeper at what we found also about the needs of multi-party businesses. So typically they would like to have uh, a single current view of all data um, for for all of the participants. Uh, they also want a way to independently verify those transactions. They want to make sure that the records are temper proof. Current approaches are not ideal in the way that you either have to have a central authority, so you have to have some kind of a network operator uh, that can securely share data with all of the participants. So you create the centralized model essentially to share all of the information, or you employ costly escrow processes. So, Clearly, neither one is ideal for some use cases. So let's see how we can reimagine supply chain um, as far as uh, a traceability use case. This is a common um, reference architecture that we've built out that really shows you how in a manufacturing use case, you can put all of the members of the network on a single shared ledger. So here we're using Amazon managed blockchain with Hyperledger fabric under the hood. In by doing this, we're allowing the manufacturer, supplier, transporter, and the regulator all being on the same ledger. So they can define the rules via chain code. They can define the validation rules for submitting transactions. They can define voting rules on how to, how to admit into the network itself. And also blockchain doesn't exist on its own. From what we've found, probably about 10, 15% of a project is blockchain itself, but then really understanding how to make it work with, let's say your IOT devices, if, you, if it is a supply chain network, with some of the insights uh, in analytics tools like QuickSight um, or Amazon QuickSight rather, um, and also making sure that you have proper data governance uh, put in place. So how do you store data off chain? Do you need any kind of locking mechanisms 
and hashing built into uh, those products. So this is a pretty solid architecture on how you would build out your own infrastructure and also how you would interact with all of the members on the blockchain network itself. And a good example of this is um, our work with Nestle. So we've partnered with Nestle on uh, building out their new suite of solutions that really focus on sustain sustainably farmed coffee. Um, and here we, we are seeing that a lot of customers are becoming more conscious of their choices and how they influence things directly out of their site. So by using blockchain technology, they could put on the same ledger all of the activities that happens from the farm to the packing supplier, to a broker, grocer, and the packing facility itself. And I didn't even know, but block, uh, that coffee is best, best consumed within, um, within six weeks of roasting. So this really shows that if you don't have visibility into the major actions that happen to this asset, uh, the, the value might be degraded and you wouldn't even know as a, as a reseller or broker or a consumer of this good. Um, so if you wanted to check out this product product demo, it's still up. So the, the team built it out so you can scan the QR code that is in the screen and really see um, how they've organized all of the dashboards, what the process looks like, and so on and so forth. So really uh, good work there. Um, now we'll touch on trade finance applications. So trade finance right now is really plagued by paper processes. So um, our teams and Amazon worked with Contour Energy to uh, track letters of credit creation. And this is becoming a really common use case because right now these processes can take upwards of 10 days. By using blockchain, you can reduce that into the matter of hours. And also all of these links will be available to everyone, uh, to the case studies after this session. Uh, again, blockchain is a horizontal technology. So in this case, we can look at use cases such as Sony Entertainment for digital rights management. So this is really looking into provenance of the digital asset. So we've examined how we're managing letters of credit. This is finance applications. We looked at supply chain. So this is tying digital ownership of a physical asset to the life cycle of this asset that allows you to de-risk some of the transactions. And now we're looking at the digital assets itself. Um, I've talked to a lot of customers in this space that really are talking about how difficult it is to, to uh, distribute royalties even evenly, especially when we're talking about static content stations. Um, some of the barcodes or the reference codes between different countries differ. So clearly there are some difficulties in how to make the systems work. And there's also cryptographically verifiable systems of record. So some of the trends that we're seeing from healthcare providers is that a lot of healthcare providers are looking to go from the value based uh, from the uh, volume based care to value based care. Uh, the increased uh, volume of digital data is becoming an issue too. And here's why Merkle trees and cryptographic verification is such a valuable tool. By storing this data in the right data structures, you can verify integrity uh, and immutability of data with a single hash comparison. So this is called attestation in terms of blockchain to where you know that nothing is the ledger uh, that is, let's say, a part of certain regulation has ever been tempered with. And you don't need to go through the auditing process of sifting through these gigabytes or zettabytes of data in this case. Uh, and, continue, and technology continues to advance. So we're seeing this paradigm shift. We're seeing new, uh, seeing new models pop up and so on. And also security. So we want to make sure that the data is stored properly, which is why it's really important to work with the trusted advisors on defining the right mechanism for PI data, defining the right mechanism for perimeter uh, protection, and so on as far as immutability of the data itself to where you know it hasn't been tempered with. Uh, one of the great examples here is a work with Medisci. So they, they're tackling the problem of authenticity in medical triers, uh, trials. So here, even 1% of data fraud can destroy the entire medical trial. And we know how important it is to have confidence, let's say, in vaccinations or medical products that you or your family are consuming. 
And here's a, a common reference architecture for systems of record on how you can stream data into QLDB or AMB and then stream it out into Kinesis to where you know that the data has been persisted in your golden copy of truth. And then you can stream it out either to DynamoDB or an S3 data lake, let's say, to run your machine learning models or whatever else you need to do to um, kind of pass it out to different teams within your company. So I went, I went through these really, really quickly uh, because I want to make sure we spend as much time as possible on diving deep on how you can support these use cases and more leveraging Amazon Managed Blockchain. Um, if you would like to uh, learn more about blockchain, here's our website. And also, if you wanted to reach me uh, personally, uh, this is the email alias that you folks can use. And on this note, I'm going to hand it back and uh, looking forward to hearing more about how the Data Art team implemented another amazing solution with Legal in general, which we're really excited to hear about. Thank you, Lana. Thank you. I mean, I know it's impossible to cover such a huge field in 10 minutes, but it appears yeah. that you did it. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully. Um, okay. <laughs> and just for, for everyone's benefit, uh, you will be hearing back from us after the, uh, the, the webinar is over. So if you uh, feel a need to uh, reach out to either ourselves or to Lana, we'll be more than happy to connect the dots for you uh, if for any reason you're not able to. Uh, retain these email al aliases and addresses that we'll be sharing through the presentation. So no worries, we'll, we've got you covered there. Um, all right, let's turn it over to Nikita. Uh, like we said, Nikita uh, has been with uh, DataArt for a number of years. He's a senior technical architect and he's implemented a number of uh, DLT, production DLT projects. One of them we're going to talk about uh, today in slightly more depth, uh, including a hands-on demonstration. Nikita, it's all yours. Hey. Hello guys, and thank you, Lana, for those valuable additions and remarks. So we will go dive into AMB, Amazon Managed Blockchain in the real world, as a practical introduction to real blockchain and distributed ledger technologies. Before we go dive in, a couple of words about me. So my name is Nikit Sosnov, and I'm technical architect at Data Art and in this company uh, more than, for more than five years. I'm a big blockchain and Golang enthusiast and also spend part of my time as a mentor in the technical community there. So that's what we will cover today. Basically, we will go from very quick overview of the basics for blockchain and distributed ledger technologies. Then we will cover main develop depl deployment options for blockchain services. Then we will dive deeply in A and B itself. And then finally, we will see hands-on practical example. We will cover deployment and development on the chain code uh, on the A and B network. So essentially, just to say that very quickly, blockchain is a linked list of records that combines into the blocks and assured cryptographically, uh, they immutable and distributed across the decentralized network. And specifically, and it is also uh, has cryptographical consensus under the hood, and that uh, updates are agreed upon any participants inside is very important. Originally, blockchain uh, is a public mechanism and tool, but uh, some permissions may be required by business, and uh, this dictated that some private or permissioned blockchains emerged. And Basically, from the business standpoint, blockchain is a way to implement a distributed ledger. In a nutshell, distributed ledger, it's just a distributed database that has no central control repository of data, but instead it stores the data across multiple participants. And in principle, those participants are working off the same data. Also, again, it's specific uh, to either permissions to that blockchain and to the synchronization processes, but in general, uh, it's very powerful, and in addition to that, it's possible to write applications uh, or smart contracts, if you please, and deploy to that distributed ledger and blockchain network directly. There are a few uh, technologies available to us. That's Hyperledger Fabric, Corda, and Ethereum, just to name a few. We will be focusing on Hyperledger Fabric because it's the main tool that was available uh, on A and B. So just to cover that real quick, that's an open source framework for developing a distributed ledger technologies uh, and blockchain-based applications. And it was designed with enterprise in mind and real enterprise-grade solutions uh, through the features like privacy, data segregation, 
and more to that, the ability to write the application with the real production-grade programming language like Golang or Java instead of using some specific pro uh, proprietary D DSL. Just a couple of words on the chain code. Basically, the chain code is a name for smart contracts in Hypology Fabric. It's a simple application that has strict uh, programming interface and a specific uh, way to work with the internal data of the blockchain. But besides that, it's just real Go or Java application. So you may use any dependencies in your projects, even your private ones. And it's really nice uh, to bring your develop, development teams right into the blockchain with some relevant experience, which would ease drastically the overall deployment. So just to recap the main business benefits for the blockchain and distributed ledgers. So just number one is the trust because all the changes are historic and history is observable and based on the consensus mechanism and cryptographically assured. Next is that single version of truth that all participants work on based on the synchronization process and also on the privacy and segregation models. But overall, generally speaking, we all as a members of the blockchain network work with the same data. And specifically quite important for today's use case we will be talking about in a minute, uh, blockchain also removes the need for that reconciliation and moving out the third party out of the way uh, it makes the uh, records keeping really fast and uh, pro provide the cheap solution uh, to do that across multiple parties without much pain. So just to cover that real uh, promising use case, that's reinsurance and business of legal and general company. And basically to make that long story uh, sh short, we can uh, just describe that very quickly. So we have the pension risk transfer process that can take for more than for the decade uh, just to work on the multi-party computations and some underlying financial obligations and these uh, applications have to be managed for that uh, decade long life cycle and um, especially in the pension risk transfer contracts and that's actual real use case here the immutability and the ability to run uh, the distributed calculation right in the network is really nice and it almost feels like the blockchain and DLT in specific uh, as a technology was developed right for this case and that's very very nice and just to cover the options for running the blockchain sure you can obviously run uh, that uh, yourself as a self-managed option but just be aware that uh, configuration and administration is non-trivial technically and there are a lot of moving parts and potential technical issues and it could lead to data losses, to the connectivity issues. And that means that you use and uh, agree on some amount of risk, operational risk, I mean, uh, when you try doing that. And also, which is, I think, the most important thing is that the notion of trust may be undermined, basically, because sometimes, and usually it's the most case for self-managed blockchain, uh, when you have a multi-company uh, network, multiple organizations on the same network, one of the organizations take more administrative roles uh, over the operations on that network. And that means basically that uh, they have that more weight on the network and they be 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 can uh, be some sort of central authority there. And basically that erode that trust to some degree. As an alternative, we can use that managed service and uh, give that heavy lifting around to the blockchain infrastructure and delegate it to a neutral party. Basically, it provides focus of us and our development teams to the business logic. And there is a growing list of multiple options uh, available on the market, but we'll be focusing on AMB, Amazon Managed Blockchain, and as one of the mature options and offerings for now. So what makes AMB uh, quite attractive from the business perspective? So first of all, uh, it's generally considered that once AWS brand is behind the technology, it's thought that uh, the technology is being quite mature and reliable enough to consider as a part of real-world application and productive workload. 
And yet another thing is that once uh, the service uh, becomes a part of AWS Suite, uh, we can easily implement that as a part of existing AWS ecosystem or an if infrastructure, and that lowers the barriers to entry the world of the blockchain even more. So just to uh, recap the capabilities for Amazon Managed Blockchain, first of all, uh, it supports uh, Hyperledger Fabric, and just as Lana mentioned, Ethereum is on the roadmap, and uh, AMB, as for the Hyperledger Fabric, manages a lot of administration uh, parts and abstracts away a lot of pieces, otherwise quite crucial and hard to support sometimes. So the first is the orderer. Basically, <laughs> the orderer is a network piece that does what it says on the team because it orders the transactions uh, on the blockchain in specific order. There is also the connectivity between uh, nodes and different uh, organizations. And it may be a bit tricky otherwise because uh, you have to remember that uh, those nodes and peers uh, reside in different uh, networks, different organizations sometimes. So otherwise, without help of AMB and AWS, it would be quite tricky. And there is also a CA management. And we may know that managing certificate authorities manually is messy once uh, we get over a certain amount of members in the network. And especially, if they don't have a uh, dedicated configuration team, just as in our practical case. So just as a part of AWS offering, yet again, uh, it provides multiple easy configuration options for us because uh, just to uh, start with AMB, we can use either API, AWS API, or CloudFormation uh, templates. We can also uh, go just with console UI and start with that, and it, it really works because Basically, the only thing we need to join AMB is to have a ready and working AWS account, and that really lowers the barrier to entry as much as possible. You can quite literally get on the blockchain network with a few simple clicks. And basically, that's by that leveraging of AMB uh, for uh, pension risk transfer platform, data art, and legal in general, we are able to provide this extremely streamlined solution where all the messy and complicated setup and configuration is invisible to our customers. And with all those new participants that can onboard the platform painlessly without any customization or operational work, the, ultimately the application transforms uh, from what used to be quite uh, complex and error-prone solution so a very streamlined customer experience. We have the data and business logic on the blockchain, and because of that built-in consensus protocol and data synchronization and AWS as a, a name, as a neutral party, all the parties can trust each other for that validity of the calculation and data and payments that reside on that. So from development or operational perspective, uh, a and B takes care of following pieces of the puzzle. So first of all, obviously A and B provides us the ability to set up the network. And the network is just the set of business entities that execute transactions amongst themselves on that uh, blockchain uh, connectivities. The member is a logical representation for that business entity or essentially for AWS accounts in that network. Uh, the CA, basically, each member has that certificate authority to make changes to the configuration uh, and uh, to the blockchain itself. And with that, we can make sure that the transaction is actually signed by the correct organization and make sure that that's real one. The node, or in uh, hyperledger te terminology, uh, a peer is a machine that runs the actual smart contract or the chain code in hyperledger te te uh, terminology yet again and sends the results uh, somewhere either in the network or just returns the results to uh, the client. And also the invite process. And as a permission network, obviously, uh, there is uh, some mechanism to invite. And usually, it's quite messy uh, with self-hosted option. But with AMB, it's really streamlined because uh, of that uh, consensus uh, mechanism under the hood we can just uh, provide the option and voting for new member to be invited. 
And once the consensus, consensus is fulfilled and the voting is successful, we can uh, send that invite to that member and member may create uh, the actual member and peer in the network and be on that network and work as any other participant, which is very cool. It's all abstracted away and you can do this and you can do this literally only through the console UI. It's very handy. And also, last but not least, there is a set of logs for nodes and chain codes uh, with a couple of metrics even for the channels, but let's say that in a second. So next slide is quite important because obviously those hyperledger fabric specific features and AMV does not provide uh, the support for them. So we have to manage and configure the things ourselves. So first of all, the channel management. The channel uh, in the Hypology Fabric is an abstraction over the network, uh, which basically unites the uh, members into logical uh, group. And it's also high level uh, data segregation because the data in the blockchain is grouped by channels. If you want to, uh, if you want to do more granular permission management, there is also private data as a business logic layer or application uh, logic layer, but we will not cover this today. So that's a great topic for the next webinar. And there is also chain code management. Basically the chain code that smart contract or blockchain application that we have to run in order to uh, achieve that actual business logic on the network. We have to install and instantiate and upgrade uh, that manually. So for both channel and chain code management, it's quite simple uh, in terms of the configuration. Uh, we, need, we have to use either, either Hypology Fabric, CLI, or SDK as an option uh, to run that. And those are one-time configuration, and there is no need uh, to do these operations constantly unless you have more and more upgrades uh, to come in your chain code. But uh, generally speaking, it's just the one-time configuration you have to be worried about. There is also uh, some set of limitations is that the order uh, is completely abstracted away and there is no direct way to check the logs for it. Uh, the other thing is that the Hypology Fabric version is set for 1.2 and 1.4 for now. So uh, 2.0 is uh, on the way, but that's the major release. So uh, it may change uh, some existing uh, template and, and deployment processes. So just be aware of that. And also there is a limited cloud formation support. Uh, so we have the workarounds and I will show those workarounds actually, but uh, not everything may be configured in input configuration and not everything is available as output values. Just to, uh, click quick, to give a quick example for that, uh, the output values as a member ID or maybe the CTKIT authority URL is not available as an output, uh, unfortunately, as of yet. So uh, in order to configure uh, and automate the setup, uh, we will be using CloudFormation and AWS API or AWS CLI, actually. And there is also the limit of six networks per account. So it's not big drama, but it may be a factor if the business grows fast and you require to onboard more customers and participate in multiple networks yourself. So, okay, from a bit more uh, close development and operational consideration, as I mentioned, because of that specific uh, Hypology Fabric version, uh, the SDK that is uh, supported may not be enough to uh, fulfill all the actions. In as an example, the package for the chain code may not be created with the SDK that is supported by the Hypology Fabric. So in order to do uh, the work and work around that, basically, we have to use uh, Hypology Fabric CLI. Yet again, as I mentioned, it's just one-time configuration, but still you have to keep that in mind. Also, there is a VPC that uh, we have to put in our infrastructure. Yet again, it's nothing specific. Just keep in mind that as you're designing your architecture. And another important piece, uh, and I think that's really important, is that there is no uh, auto healing or auto scaling management for our node or peers, name it as you please. So it's possible to do that yourself, basically provide your own tooling, and we've done that in our instance. So just be prepared to budget for it. And as a performance uh, consideration, it's reasonably speedy, but well, it's a blockchain after all, so not expect no land speed records. And 
about the basic ways to uh, connect uh, the, uh, the connect the clients to the blockchain network. Uh, so tight connection in here assumes that we just built the client right in our traditional application or monolith, if you please, using the SDK. And it, you can certainly do that, and we've done that before previously, uh, even before AMB. But be aware that uh, this will increase the complexity of your application, basically because of that blockchain-related logic of events, the order, the execution speed, the waiting for the events to come up and all that stuff. So there is an alternative. And basically, uh, we built client-specific microservice and use the traditional uh, communication schema with other services uh, within our application swarm, so to speak. It also adds the complexity in its own way as a new microservice in the grand scheme of things. But with the modern tools and orchestration uh, things, we can just add that as yet another service and be good to go. And if you consider that when you use Q or just consider even driven architecture, it works really well with the existing blockchain and distributed ledger world. And on the next slide, we have real life example for uh, our legal and general clients uh, organizational account. So basically, uh, this is what deployed for each of those. We have the, uh, that uh, loose client in the middle that connects to the blockchain network and uh, works with our peers that uh, have that blockchain application. The set of calculations are built in the chain codes and sends the results to other networks components and synchronizes the data and sends the events uh, back to the traditional application through the SQS through the uh, queues and also receives the messages and commands as we will uh, try that ourselves too uh, through the same uh, through the uh, same uh, technology sqs the traditional application also has elastic storage as a cache basically it provides uh, us that maximized performance that we may need uh, to avoid some blocks uh, or limitations of the blockchain and every piece of this client infrastructure is observable and configurable from a standalone configurational platform uh, that on the very bottom side of our slide. Uh, and that orchestrates the deployment for our members. Okay, with that, uh, we've fin finished with our basic and theory part on the way. So before we actually dive into our demo, uh, let's be prepared for this. So we will have three part demo. On part one, we will deploy the network. We will review how we do that. We will go through the cloud formation practical setup and then see how it looks when it's done. On the part two, we will configure the network. We will use in the same uh, type of configuration we're using in the real project. We will be using that client application uh, and communicate with it through SQS. So we will create the channel. We will talk about that. Uh, to, we will create uh, the package, inst uh, install it, and instantiate the chain code on our peer. We will discuss the chain code and even look inside of its source code, which is quite interesting just to provide a glimpse. And as a part three, we will operate with that network just very briefly. We will call the chain code, we will invoke it and query, tell about, talk about the difference, and then we will check the results. So with that in mind, uh, quick side note. Uh, so the uh, deployment itself takes around 30 minutes. So uh, I've done that beforehand, before the demo, to make the smooth experience. Uh, so just let's talk about uh, every piece of our infrastructure that we've done. So as I mentioned, uh, we will be using the cloud formation for the most part, but for one of the uh, stacks, the agent stack, we will talk about that in a second, uh, we will be using both cloud formation and also AWS CLI tool. So as a first part, we will be talking about the pre-flight template. Basically, it, what it says, it prepares us, it gives us S3 bucket uh, for our A and B chain code files, uh, where to store them or to put the temporary artifacts there, and also the ECR repo. So we just use that in order to automate and ease the deployment for our SDK client, which is very nice. The second step, is to deploy that AMV network itself. This will uh, start the network. This will create the member for us, for our organization, and also create the node for us with the specific parameters. It's, as, as you can see, it's just the regular 
uh, cloud formation template, nothing too specific. The next thing is the VPC. Well, it's very straightforward, nothing specific to it. And the communication stack. So the communication stack is the stack of uh, SQS queues. We have two pairs of queues. And despite that we will not use one of the pairs, uh, I decided to put the, the same two pairs uh, we, will, we are using in the real project, basically, just uh, to provide the feel of the configuration because of, uh, one of the pair is used for daily uh, work and the other uh, pair of queues is used for the configuration. So we will not be using that uh, for daily use, obviously, but still, it's nice to have that available to us. And the last uh, CloudFormation uh, template is the agent. So the agent is actually uh, that application that has uh, SDK client inside. I'll be using that client or client SDK, but just for you to, uh, to know, uh, it has an agent name because it can be installed in every AWS infrastructure as an agent and thus enable the possibility to communicate with uh, the blockchain, which is actually nice. So uh, there is quite a few parameters. Uh, so uh, let's just look briefly in the script. So as I mentioned, we're using the actual uh, AWS tool, uh, CLI tool, in order to get required endpoints and names and CA endpoints and everything else, just to uh, set up our SDK uh, connection in that client application. So that is what we need to run in the order I named it. So pre-flight, uh, network, VPC, uh, communication, and then SDK client. Uh, let's look on this. So as, as I mentioned, there are five steps. So let's look on our network. So that's the network we have. It's done now. And we have all the parameters here. And as I mentioned, you can start with your uh, console only. You don't have to run that through those automation scripts, but it is the deployment. By the way, uh, if you at some point decide to look uh, on the source code or those scripts, uh, you may contact us and afterwards, and we will share that with you and provide that to you. So hang on. And we have that member, first member for our organization, and uh, we have all the details and endpoints we need uh, here too. We also have the node. The node uh, has some channels inside, there's a test. It also has the logs available to us, and we will be reviewing those logs uh, as a next step for our demo. But uh, as we can see, everything is deployed and ready. So let's just go and create the channel. So uh, as a way to communicate uh, through that queue, we decided to have a set of strict JSON formatted uh, messages and commands to uh, make it clear for everyone in the team, in development team, or just as a even operational uh, consideration, because it's very easy to uh, do uh, the thing that I'm doing at the moment, just literally go to SQS console and uh, send the messages manually. So uh, as you can see, we will be creating the channel. Uh, the channel will have the demo channel name. So that's quite obvious. So let's just send the message and see the result. So let's receive the message, all for it, and see the result. That's what I call demo effect. But actually we have that uh, channel sent to the correct queue. And there is oh, no many, not, yeah, even, not even Bill Gates is immune from the effect, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, basically the other way to make sure everything's right uh, is that uh, we can go to the peer or to the node directly and observe if we have any uh, transactions 
over the channel available to this peer and we can update. So there is data channel and data channel and then pre-demo channel. So uh, there were three channels before, so there should be fourth one. But oh, there is a message, so it was just, so create channel is okay. Usually this, uh, this command takes a couple of seconds to run off, but this time it decided to do something else during the time, so it's fine now. So as we created the channel, that uh, abstraction layer over the members, uh, as I mentioned, uh, this automatically joins the uh, member, the admin, the creator of uh, this channel, and then we may also manually add new members to the channel. Uh, we've done the fully automate, automation process, automated process on our platform, but as we are alone at this point of time, let's try and uh, create and support the chain code there. So it, as I mentioned, there is a three-step process package, install and chain code. And as we execute those, let's uh, execute those and discuss everyone of those. So the first step is that package of the chain code. Basically, it's very nice because uh, it's not that we just take the source code uh, in the zip archive and provide that as a raw source code to the peer we have that specific package that has not the consensus protocol yet, but uh, the cryptographically signed uh, and verifiable uh, mark on the package. That means that the piece of code that uh, we create here and then install on our peer could be the same as the uh, piece of code that can be installed on any other peer, so which is quite important uh, for everyone to trust each other's, not just data, but calculations also. And uh, as I mentioned uh, briefly, uh, on next major version of Hyperledge Fabric uh, 2.0 and any other uh, version going for, uh, forward, uh, there will be a consensus protocol where every member may agree or disagree, if they please, to uh, install that package so that's very nice and because that package is signed it's always verifiable uh, whether the package is the same or not so let's see the result for now yeah so the package is created for now you even can see that package s3 bucket key this is the uh, bucket i've mentioned uh, previously so it provides uh, the storage for the chain codes and for the packages. So it's done now. So let's go and make the second step, the install. Actual install is the process that actually uh, compiles the source code from the package to the peer and allows that peer to use the source code in the future. The process itself is quite fast too. So let's just see that all in for the message. Yep, there is a sort message available to us. Yep, so the package is installed and the final step is the instantiation. Basically, the instantiation process is when we uh, put the uh, data and the chain code in the ready state. Uh, and if we have complex chain code, it's not our case for now, but if we have the chain, uh, complex chain code that uh, had, that needs specific value to be uh, installed beforehand. Uh, the instantiate process helps with that. And that's, by the way, one of the parts of that specific API I was talking about in the very beginning of that process. So this uh, instantiation process may take a couple of minutes even, so it may even uh, time out if uh, the network and the peer not in the right mood. So uh, let's just wait for it in a minute or so, but uh, just a short preview. Once this instantiation is done, uh, we will go and check the source code of our chain code. Uh, that's the Golang application and verify that that's a real application that uh, can be run on the blockchain. And because of that uh, has a specific interface I mentioned in the very beginning. Yeah, and we have that expiration that I mentioned. So that means that we need to run this uh, command second time because uh, despite the, having that expiration on the background, it will end. And, and once we have uh, that finished, we will see uh, that 
new message is available to us and that new message will uh, specify that instantiation is finished so that's okay and as i mentioned that's the chain code this is a real golang application for us with some caveats yes so first of all and there are three actually so the first is that uh, we need to bundle in specific interface with the specific entry point here uh, just to support the blockchain and Hakology fabric in specific. Uh, and you can see a few methods here, init or short of initialize and invoke. So init is basically the method, method that is run uh, when we have that initialize process. And invoke is when we either invoke or query the chain code. By the way, just short introduction. When we operate with the chain code, we may either request the data and don't assume any changes to the blockchain, uh, or we can make an invoke. And that invoke means that uh, we may bring some changes to the ledger if the request is successful. So in our case, we have very simple application of uh, key value storage on the blockchain. Uh, and from the perspective of the overall architecture, it's pretty straightforward. So that's the first point. The second point is that uh, there is no way we can reach the internet. So everything works just fine as a real Go application. But once we try to hit something outside of our blockchain network, uh, there will be no success for us. And the final sort thing is that how we work with the data. So for the most part, uh, Hypology Fabric uses uh, the uh, key value database for uh, the chain codes, but there is also an option, an option uh, for using the CouchDB uh, solution, uh, which is very nice too. Uh, but for now, we don't need anything. So that's just very simple key value uh, storage with the end memory. And we operate with that as a uh, state, and we either put state or get state. So that's very simple. But every other part of the application is abstracted away and you can work as a real Golang application. And you may even bring your own dependencies with a rendering option. So uh, because of the specific Apology Fabric version, the Google version is limited too. So you may not use uh, modules here if you're Golang enthusiast. But uh, there is a way to bring your own uh, packages into the blockchain. And that's very nice, assuming you have a uh, development team with Golang experience. So basically, we have very simple key value storage with simple interface that we can either get something from the ledger or put something into the ledger. So let's run those commands too. So let's invoke the ledger. And invoke assumes that we put something into the blockchain. So let's invoke and put some key, wait, first, and then we can have the value as a second, as an example. So let's send, send that message. And let's call for the result. This should come up quite quickly. I'd say even blazingly fast. So let's check that. And there is instantiate. So let's wait for further. Yeah, that's the message for us. Invoke the chain code, OK. So we don't see any actual result here because of the API. It just says OK to us. But let's query the chain code and see if our first key brings us to some brings us something. So let's check and pull for yet another message. Yeah, and I would imagine this is it. Yep, we have that query response as a second. So let's just assume. Uh, and try to run something with a wrong key, as an example. So let's send that message and try and receive it. It's still polling, so we will be able to check that. So we can see that failure from the query and the error actual value not found. So this is uh, from the code. So uh, we can have that simplistic error uh, handling but actually, what is nice, and I mentioned that in the very beginning of our uh, overview, we have the possibility to check that. So let's just go and check the chain code log. So we have the de demo uh, chain code, and let's just see our logs in CloudWatch, which is very nice. And as I mentioned, that because of 
that uh, AWS suite and overall infrastructure around the blockchain, it's very easy to support this solution, otherwise very costly at, and error prone and configuration heavy. So we can see that we have our initialize that is complete. Then we can see that uh, something was stored successfully with the key we have. Then we try to retrieve the data and then we encountered an error. So this is very convenient for us. And on this point, we're basically done with the demo and with the part. So just as a general thought and the uh, final moment, I think that everything that we've discussed here is really nice and that uh, managed blockchains and A and B in specific are here to stay. And I think that's a really nice thing because it not just lowers the barriers to entry to the development teams, it also brings uh, the option of blockchain and distributed ledger to big enterprise great businesses and products and that means that by de-risking that adoption uh, we may bring a lot of new possibilities uh, to uh, the industry overall so it was very nice to have you uh, and i'm very thankful to you and you're welcome to ask any questions i'm happy to answer those thank you Thank you, Nikita. Thank you so much. Uh, we have had a number of questions come up during the session. So Lana, thank you for graciously answering them and, and uh, adding to my incomplete and uh, non-specific answer to one of those. So we can share uh, the asked and answered questions along with the meeting notes and the links to the recording that we're going to be uh, circulating later. There's a couple of um, a couple of questions that still remain. So James asks if Golang is a deterministic language. Yeah, so basically, uh, if you mean that once you run something on it, the answer is yes, because uh, it's compiled and it's uh, type safe. So you always know and uh, what you will be getting in the results, unless there is some explicit random part of it. So once you compute something in Golang, uh, you well know that it's there. And it's very nice. The other option besides that is that you may write the chain code in uh, Java or in JavaScript, even if you like that, if you need that as an option. So the, the short answer is yes. I think we have another question here on, yeah. um, on pluggable consensus. So whether you can um, configure that within Hyperledger Fabric. So for the version uh, that uh, we've demo today, which is 1.4, EOV is the consensus model. So you actually, it, it's pretty stuck. <laughs> so there, there isn't an easy way to configure that. So there isn't a way to change that for, um, for, for, for A and B. And the follow up here, whether it supports endorse or during validate phase. No, the, the stages are endorse, order, and validate. And this is just, the way uh, Hyperledger fa Fabric simulates transactions before it sends them to the ordering service, which is then later on validated by the blocks. So that's 1.4 specifics there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you, Lana. And do you, do you mind saying just one of, or, or two words on the portability? I Like I said, I did provide a very generic answer. You, you answered with more specific content there, but it is something that obviously comes up in many conversations, mm -hmm. especially with the business. So can, of course. Uh, do you care to expand a little bit? Thank you. Yeah, no problem. So right now, uh, the, the right model, if, if this is a concern, let's say that you want to make sure that the transactions are portable. Um, some of the ways that we're seeing customers use that is by creating a listener to where you would actually pipe all of the events from blockchain into a site database to where you can easily replace them between multiple networks. So let's say if you need to replay it on a self-managed network or in a test network, so it really doesn't matter. We don't really care where it goes, but there is a way to replay those transactions. There is some manual labor that is a part of that, uh, but uh, just like uh, with all of the A and B frameworks, these are open source frameworks. So the same transaction, um, uh, components as you would find in 
open source are the same ones that we support. So there shouldn't be any mm -hmm. issues. And again, really, really important to make sure that, you know, your chain code is stored properly, uh, which is really great to see Nikita, Nikita's uh, architecture in the way that everything is templatized, right? So you do have your chain code that's put in packages to where it doesn't matter where you really deploy it. Um, so again, source control is really important. API separation, queuing, uh, having a site chain code database, let's say, for all of the transactions, things like that are really important for operational excellency. Thank you so much. I'm thank afraid you. we are up on time. I want to thank everyone again for joining this morning. I hope you found value uh, in the presentations today. I'm sure I certainly did. Uh, we will be sharing links to the recording when that becomes available later. I, I think it's going to take us a couple of days or so. A couple of days or so, we will be sharing the questions and the answers received during the session with there as well. Thank you, Dennis, Tushar, um, Parveen, um, and uh, James and Hugo for your questions. Uh, if your questions remain unanswered, we will uh, reach out to one or both of the speakers to get the answers for you. And uh, let's put the last slide on on the screen, please. Uh, with the email address, you can reach out to us uh, if you're interested in exploring some uh, blockchain-based projects and you need some help navigating the technology. We're more than happy to jump on a call with you, help you brainstorm together, share any of the practical experience that we have. Um, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Thanks again, everybody, and we'll see you at the next event. Thank you. Thank you.